so, so this is really a great uh, uh, dialogue that uh, we hope that we can really have uh, uh, with David. But before we get into the details, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our guest, distinguished guest today. Uh, Professor David Lambert is a famous China hand and has actually a, a distinguished career spanning nearly five decades uh, in the study of Chinese politics and foreign policy and Sino-US relations. So currently, he's a senior research fellow at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Study, SAS, uh, at its Foreign Policy Institute, where he was also formerly the dean of the faculty uh, of the uh, SAS and also uh, uh, George and the Sadi Human Professor and the Director of China so, Studies. He was most recently Oxenberg Ruhelen Fellow at Stanford University Asia Pacific Research Center from 2019 to 2020. I, I know <laughs> Professor Lamton for a long time. I, I remember very well. You, uh, you know, you invited me to to SAS to give a talk around year of uh, 2010 when I was at Bookings and. Uh, and also, uh, you you visited uh, CCG in the year. Gave a talk time. there. Yeah, give a talk there. Yes, that's right. So, so really, a, a great uh, memories uh, you you had with us. Uh, also, uh, uh, and also, not uh, in addition to the academics. Actually, uh, Professor uh, Lamb is a former chairman and and now member of the board of the director of the Asia Foundation and also former president and, and current board member of National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. So, so you have many uh, 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 academic and social titles, and you have been really uh, uh, very, uh, played a significant role in uh, maintaining and uh, promoting an understanding between uh, U.S.-China. So, so really a, a great uh, uh, welcome to, <laughs> to our dialogue. So perhaps before we, we get started, maybe you uh, can give some uh, 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 the initial uh, analysis and uh, on, the, on the latest uh, uh, development of China-U.S. relations, uh, particularly how you view this, uh, uh, you know, recent uh, 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 President Xi and President Biden virtual summit, and what what's your general take of uh, of the of this uh, current uh, U.S.-China relation? You know, since you are <laughs> such a great <laughs> expert on, on U.S.-China relations, perhaps you can also have a little opening remark. <laughs> David, yes. Well, I, I think the first thing to say is that, w in a way, we're in the most unprecedented time in U.S.-China relations, perhaps since Nixon went to China in 1972. And the mere fact that our relationship right now is in an unprecedented situation, I think, means there are no experts. This is... Uh, a situation that we haven't confronted in a long time. And so to borrow a, a phrase from Deng Xiaoping, I think both sides are feeling their way across the river by feeling the stones. So I think we are engaged in a kind of incremental, step-by-step -step attempt to understand how we can manage this relationship in a far different way environment. And that environment uh, is different from what we dealt with for the last 40 years in several respects. And one is that, of course, the uh, China has made enormous strides in its economic power and its capacity to shape the regional economic architecture and infrastructure. And of course, uh, military power uh, relationship has fundamentally uh, changed. Uh, and so it's quite natural to say we are really confronting an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented situation. I think uh, President Xi, uh, and I, I can't speak for President Biden for sure, uh, but I think they would both agree that our principal need at the current time is to avoid what was called, I think President Xi said, catastrophic mistakes. So uh, if we ask, uh, is the big danger catastrophic mistakes, and then talk about the Xi-Biden virtual meeting of last week, 
I think uh, that meeting somewhat gives me more confidence that uh, there is a will to manage this relationship on both sides. So I think I'm a little more confident of our ability to manage things for the next period of time than I was. But I would want to emphasize that I think we, we have not fundamentally addressed the major issues, um, much less resolve them, that are creating the problems. Uh, if you think about it, for the last 40 years, our, our growing economic relationship was a positive factor in the relationship. Uh, now economics is a very contentious part. And though we had an agreement uh, between the United States and China under President Trump in 2020, uh, quite frankly, that, that a, a trade and economic agreement was not lived up to. Uh, uh, we've, and we still have tariffs that resulted after uh, uh, there had been hope with the new administration here in Washington, we might ease up on tariffs. So I would say no fundamental progress on the economic side. Um, on the, uh, let us say, military and security side, I thought the fact that they talked a little about, as I would understand, arms control, from an American point of view, I think, without speaking for our government, that when we now for the fir first time might be able to talk meaningfully about arms control, at least in a limited sense, I take that to be positive. And the, uh, the uh, sense I got from the, uh, the virtual summit that our military to military may engage more seriously with each other in dialogue. If that happens, I think that's good. But fundamentally, we're in an arms race, and this virtual summit did not stop it. And it's, uh, it has quite a momentum in both our societies, because a lot of budgets involved, perceptions of threat on both sides are involved, uh, and technology has a logic of its own. So I would say the two big drivers of US-China relations, economics and strategic security issues, the virtual summit, as far as I can see, did not really address them. So just to summarize, I think it's better to talk than not to talk. I'm glad we're talking. I think that's certainly the first step to make progress. But frankly, I didn't see very much progress. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, thank you, David. I, I think you, you, you made uh, uh, quite uh, uh, you know unique analysis, actually. Uh, uh, you mentioned this dialogue is important, and uh, also that uh, uh, you know that act helps to create some atmosphere for further dialogues. I think that certainly uh, uh, important. I noticed somehow, you know, of course uh, that uh, you know President Xi actually referred to, to President Biden as old friend, and uh, so that they have a lot of uh, exchanges, uh, uh, dialogues in the past. But one, one thing, uh, as you said, also, uh, President Xi mentioned, we, we try to, you know, avoid catastrophe <laughs> mistakes uh, like that. But, but, but President Biden said something, I think, quite uh, uh, interesting to, to Chinese, too, because he really said uh, uh, that he does not seek to change China and uh, does not seek uh, a build up alliance against China and also uh, recognize the one China policy. And so that is in line with what he has actually said uh, in the uh, when he put out the troop from Afghanistan, uh, that, uh, that during the announcement, he said he's uh, no longer seek nation building, you know, <laughs> for Afghanistan, or maybe to that matter of, uh, of Iraq, Sri Lanka, or, or Libya, or, or Middle East. So, so, so there are some changes the, uh, uh, there. So, so what I'm thinking is that if that, uh, you know, if the U.S. do not seek uh, 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 nation changing or, or Oh, because one of the complaints we hear very often is that, oh, you, you know, we have uh, helped supported you join WTO, supported your reform, but you didn't become one of us, you didn't converge, you didn't, uh, you know, become what uh, a more uh, 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 similar like us. So, so, so probably there, with that singular, singling uh, 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 a change that you is now starting to recognize, you know, China is what it is, and giving its 5,000 his, history and its logic development and uh, all those aspects, 
perhaps uh, you know the two countries uh, can really think about the framework how they can <coughs> peacefully <coughs> live together like president she said you know uh, respect to each other you know peacefully coexisting and try to be win-win you know so what do you think about that do we does president trump sounds a little and uh, biden sounds a little different than the previous you know whereas uh, during the trump era you know everything you know, CBC is bad, you know, 100 million party members cannot come to the United States and, and, and this and that. So this probably sounds uh, some, some sh shifting in terms of, uh, 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 you know, recognize the reality and how to think about we can uh, work towards the future. What do you think about this framework that uh, we're trying to reshape a bit? Well, uh, first of all, I agree the, with the, uh, the words that you highlighted uh, old friends, a friendly word, a set of words, concept. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I think there was some recognition that it's uh, in, uh, the attempt to change the internal values operations of another political system uh, are difficult. I think there was some recognition uh, of that. Uh, but I think they're all, and also on Taiwan, I would say you're right, he reiterated the one China policy. But uh, on the other hand, he's been reiterating the one China policy all along. At the same time, there have been some changes, you might say, in the implementation of that policy. And I don't think I heard him say that he was going to change implementation that much. Maybe I missed that. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yes, those are positive words, but I don't think they represent much change. And if you think about it, and it should be clear from what I've said, I certainly don't propose to speak for the U.S. government or the Biden administration, but uh, we have the summit of democracies coming up. Uh, uh, that's a, a, a high priority uh, for President Biden. And he's talked about the global situation as, in a sense, a struggle between autocracies and democracies. And usually he mentions that China is a principal um, uh, concern in that regard. So I, I see a bit more ideological content to uh, the, a Biden administration uh, certainly than the Obama administration that uh, he was vice president in. Trump, uh, frankly, was all over the lot, wasn't consistent, uh, and I took a grain of salt on, on a lot of things he had to say. You're right that he uh, impl tried to implement a policy of uh, not permitting uh, the 98 million members of the Communist Party to come to here, I frankly, I never understood how we would even know in many cases the status of individuals coming. So uh, I, I didn't take terribly seriously a lot that uh, President Trump had to say, but he was president and he did have levers of power and occasionally he did do things that um, uh, had a uh, real impact. So, but long and the short of it is, I don't think any of the friendly statements I heard there fundamentally changed the, the, the relationship. I think it, uh, it provided avenues to talk about the real problems. And I hope we will seize this opportunity. I think in a way it maybe, I don't wanna quite say stabilized our relationship, uh, but at least it made it less fragile, I think, and gives us a little time to operate. But the question is, what are we really going to do to change the calculations of the other side? And I did note uh, that uh, in the course of the virtual summit, there was talk about red lines on Taiwan. And certainly even in the wake of the meeting uh, between Xi and Biden virtually, uh, tensions continue in the Taiwan Straits and the uh, movement of naval and other assets by both sides uh, continues. So just for example, I don't see uh, a big change in the security 
situation in the in Taiwan Straits, certainly over the long run. Yeah, th thank you, uh, David. I, I think that uh, you, you're, you're right. The tension in the in the Taiwan Strait is still there, even though the U.S. has uh, repeatedly said that they, they, they respect one China policy. But recent year, we see, uh, you know, even Trump uh, sent his undersecretary to, to Taiwan, and we see several plane loads of congressmen uh, visit Taiwan recent months, and, and, uh, and President, you know, the Taiwan Authority leader said uh, there was uh, U.S. personnel, military personnel based in Taiwan. So, so all those, you know, uh, things that... Uh, and on, on top of that, we see a, a parade of warships, uh, navies, uh, sails through uh, the Taiwan Strait as well. So, so I think China has to respond, has to, uh, you know, uh, uh, react. But, but basically, I, I really think that, uh, you know, that probably we should uh, really come back to the three communique and really come back to the uh, this uh, one China policy or principle, whatever that uh, has been agreed upon and they're not going to uh, I irritate the status quo. So, so I think if that is done, maybe we could have a, uh, you know, as you said, we can uh, stabilize maybe not, at least uh, keep, <laughs> stop uh, the downwards, uh, uh, you know, spiral on, on, on the bilateral relations. But, but right. also I, 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 I think you are right. You know, even though President Biden, you know, he was said at, at, at the UN's uh, General Assembly, say, okay, we are not seeking to, uh, build up two camps. We don't want to uh, ask people to take sides and things like that. Yet they are having this uh, <laughs> the democracy uh, uh, summit, which I think it's kind of a, a ironic to, to divide the world into a de democ dem democracy or non-democracy or autocracy, whatever. You know, that's another way of uh, setting up the camps, basically. And uh, but uh, you know, these days, I mean, China also. <laughs> Uh, they may not have this uh, exactly same style of a Western democracy, but but they, they do have, a, you know, you're probably aware that this consultative democracy, they, they have a lot of a consultation. For example, the 14th five years plan, they, they, they sought about over 1 million comments and suggestions. And also they have this whole process, which means, uh, you know, there's always experts, uh, delegates, CPPCC members involved all year round to give the government, uh, uh, you know, recommendation, critics, and all all kind of plan to compare. So that's probably, uh, that's why I was thinking that the President Biden side not, not going to change in China is maybe give some credit to this system, you know, because uh, if China is, is, is everything is, is a bad decision, how can China, you know, leave, leave 800 million people out of poverty or really build the, you know, best uh, probably infrastructure in the world? I mean, uh, you know, the KPI doesn't really uh, substantiate that. So, 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 so this kind of a, a two camps on, on, on democracy or, or, or non-democracy, really, it's another way U.S. is still trying to do things like that, uh, which I think a lot of uh, Chinese people are really uh, confused. So I think maybe you can, yeah. The way I, I, I would frame the problem is that I think you used the phrase, will President Biden give credit for consultative democracy? <laughs> <laughs> and I think the short answer to that question in, in terms of what I would anticipate him to do would be, no, he's not going to do that. And then you would ask yourself, well, why? And I think this gets to the fundamental dilemma of our two, our, our relationship. And it's equally true in Beijing and China more broadly, and in Washington and the United States. And that is, the political calendar in both of our countries does not make being reasonable, conciliatory, and flexible very easy to do for either leader. Of course, Xi Jinping just had the sixth plenum, and by my reading, it uh, from his point of view, and uh, was uh, achieved what he wanted to achieve, uh, but. There is no reward in Chinese politics for being very flexible with the Americans. And, and if you look ahead to the 20th Party Congress coming up next year, it's going to be very difficult for, I would say, any Chinese leader, but I would think this is true with the current Chinese leadership, to be too flexible in the documents of the six-party plenum and in 
there was a lot of concern about subversion from the U.S. Uh, and, and its activities in Hong Kong and elsewhere. So I would say the level of suspicion in China of the U.S. has not been diminished. And the domestic political situation in China does not reward leaders for being flexible and accommodating to the United States. And by the same token, it's at least as true in the United States. Next year, we have congressional elections that will dictate or the results of which will dictate who controls both houses of Congress. And of course, that's why Biden is so desperate or anxious to get his legislation passed now, because he can't be sure he'll have a Congress that will pass it uh, after the elections next year. And frankly, he either has to use his capital to, per, to pass legislation on infrastructure and building more uh, social equity in the US. He doesn't want to spend his capital saying nice things about China that are going to be criticized. And then of course, when we're past the 22 elections for Congress, we're going to be then into a campaign for the next president. And pre leave it aside whether Mr. Trump will be a major force in US politics and maybe a candidate. And I think both of those things are possible. Uh, the spirit of populism and what you might call Trumpism is very strong here in the United States. So uh, all I'm saying is the domestic political environment in both our countries does not encourage either leader to be seen as weak by their respective publics. So that it, it's this concatenation of domestic inflexibility, nationalism in both our countries, exaggeration, rumor, uh, and then of course, the power relationship and the economic relationship is changing. So uh, it's just uh, as uh, one observer said many long time ago, it's an enigma wrapped up in a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, <laughs> I think your, 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 your analysis really uh, uh, brought up this question about uh, uh, deglobalization, you know, and nationalism, uh, populism is, is running high probably uh, uh, in the United States and probably also in China. So, uh, so that is really not good for, for, for the leaders to, to really have a, exactly. a, a deep dialogue and, 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 and facing uh, its own challenge. For example, I, you're right, you know, Trump, uh, President Biden is uh, having his midterm election coming up of the Congress. And then you know, on the Senate, they are barely just have one one more seat with the Vice President Harris there. So, uh, so you know, the, the dynamic can change. And also, they are losing a seat in the Virginia governor race recently uh, to the Republicans. So, uh, so that that's exactly uh, the dilemma we are facing. So, I, I, I'm thinking of you know, I mean, I mean, U.S. China, uh, of course, uh, have its own path of development. China basically is living in a world of democracy. I mean, U.S. probably is the largest opposition party. You know, you got to got to be watched by all the countries and and things like that. Uh, but 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 China also have a do domestic. You know, uh, you know they have a market. Uh, uh, I, I would refer that as a market democracy or technology democracy. You know, one billion smartphone users actually uh, can can decide what they do on a daily basis, of voting every day. So, so somehow, you know, I think this, this in, in internal uh, energy and a synergy w will continue. But, but I'm uh, just thinking, yeah. I was just going to say, you mentioned a couple of times technology. And I mentioned that I thought part of the problem we've got is a technological race. And part of that technology race is over economic dominance and, and control or at least... Uh, uh, success within the future industries. Uh, and uh, I think one, just give one example, artificial sure. intelligence. Now we have the capacity to delegate decisions within militaries uh, to 
essentially machines. Uh, we have machines now with logarithms to de determine uh, what phrases will be selected for advertisements, for political advertisements, for propaganda. Uh, and, and the purpose of many of these um, um, mechanisms to select uh, thought and, um, uh, and uh, exaggerate conflict. They exaggerate conflict within our own societies and between societies. So I think one of the new elements in our relationship is this technological race. It's partly for economic dominance, but technology has its own logic. And part of that logic seems to be in, in, to increase conflict and also the delegation of uh, military decisions to machines. I think is a very dangerous trend that we have to be mindful of. So I think one of the new aspects here is technology. And how are we going to, as two countries, come together to cooperate to make sure that, so to speak, it's man running the machines and not the machines running man? Yeah, yeah right. I, I, absolutely. I, I think, you know, that really, I, I, as I recall, it's really start from uh, probably President Trump that... Uh, He's really, uh, you know, uh, starting to uh, really decouple and uh, banning the use of uh, uh, companies like uh, Huawei or ZTE, or and then we, we see a host of company being put on the on a list uh, during the Trump administration. You know that kind of a, a decoupling uh, uh, in technology actually already happened somehow. You know, and uh, and and also that forced China to to develop on its own now. So so it's really. Not healthy. I think we we use the technology to conquer, you know, uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, you know the, the the universe and then everything, but not really into a, a, a arms race or, or a military uh, a competition. Well, so, so that's not really great. I'm 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 not sure most <laughs> Americans would agree with that, but the way I would uh, uh, put it is that uh, because there is this decoupling going on. And in China, just like in the sense of the U.S., there's talk of self-reliance because when you have security problems with a country, you don't want to depend on them for strategic items, whether it's food or uh, machinery, uh, high-tech machinery or uh, whatever. So that, uh, but I think the United States sees China as increasing the state enterprise sector, because that's where some of your most advanced, but not all your most advanced firms are. And so I think the American storyline is, is China's increasing state control of key aspects of the economy, particularly in the security area. And therefore the United States uses that as a justification to clamp down on export uh, exports of certain goods to China. Uh, it, it's working with Taiwan for a big investment in computer chips in the American Southwest. Uh, in other words, we're each responding by creating our own independent economic and technological subsystems. And when one side does it, the other side reacts. And so in a way, I, I don't find it very productive to say who started this. What yeah. I find it productive to say is we now are in a problem. So what are we jointly going to do to solve the problem? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, 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 David, you're right that, uh, <clears throat> you know, we do have a huge problem. You know, I, I, I would probably interpret that somehow to, uh, to, to the mistrust and, of course, also to a misunderstanding to some extent. For example, in China, you know that SOE, you know, China has always been a highly centralized country, have thousands of years history, big irrigation project, you know, across the geographically uh, big country. So SOE or big gigantic project is always uh, tackled uh, uh, by the state. And that really helps the, uh, you know, lift the 800 million people out of poverty or having this uh, big infrastructure project across the country, uh, Three Gorges dams or, 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 or Hong Kong, uh, Guangzhou, uh, you know, Macau, uh, you know, ocean bridges. 
those projects. So, so SOE play a unique role in China, but somehow uh, is not really inter understood well uh, outside China. But also, for example, you know the 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 uh, the, 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 the the rural area. I mean, the, the Wi-Fi rate by the China Telecom and China Unicom has to be uh, low so that they can really help in the villagers. Yeah. So. So, so there's a lot of lot of understanding. I think we 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 haven't really got that. Uh, well, well I think well. you're right in terms of China's history, uh, in terms of its rice culture. You've always needed to have big water projects that had to be almost initiated by government or very large uh, government entities. Uh, you have a different history, a different. Um, uh, geography you have to deal with, a much bigger population. But in the same token that I think we should better, un or at least Americans should better understand China's particular circumstances, I think China needs to recognize our particular circumstances. <laughs> and our particular uh, circumstances are small and medium business is the backbone of the American economy. And uh, even our biggest corporations, for the most part, have little or no direct ownership by our government. And so when in our politics, the private sector or small business looks at China and they say, how can we compete with state financed corporations that have descent, uh, centralized or more centralized decision making. So while it's understandable uh, where China's economic and organization came from and why you do it, on the other hand, it's just precisely the kind of um, economic management and philosophy that scares a, pub, a private sector, small and medium business sized country. So I, we're not going to solve this problem, but I think for the last 40 years in the process of trying to get into WTO, and I hope we, along with China and its application to the, the TPP, the new version of TPP, I hope maybe we can move towards both trying to join that and once again, try to develop common, at least more common economic practices that will reduce the tension. So my basic feeling is the last few years where we didn't join AIIB or we didn't join TPP or you set up RCEP, we're developing, we're growing apart. And it seems to me we have to get back in trying to grow a little more together. Uh, and we've got to take care, uh, take account of your needs for centralization and scale. But you need to take into account our demand by our private sector. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think you're, you're right. You know, you, we, we all have a special circumstances. Of course, China has its characteristic and U.S. has its characteristic how we can really, uh, you know, minimize that gap and understand each other better. I think that, uh, you know, a uh, 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 mechanism like a WTO, where I think multilateralism still really is the, is the answer for that. I'm glad that you mentioned about uh, uh, RCEP and the CPTPP and, uh, you know, China uh, joined one of them and, and, and trying to join the other one. And that all actually uh, very, very important uh, mechanism for minimize the uh, differences and the enhanced understanding because CPTPP is largely designed by the U.S. and China is willing to join that. <laughs> the Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce has put the CPTPP <laughs> agreement on the MoveCom website. Here's the target to shoot for. Let's let's do it. So so that that probably is the way to find much common uh, ground and uh, and talk to each other and that's you know through those multilateral arrangements. Of course, I agree with that, but it, it's not going to be easy. Uh, that CPPTPP uh, yeah, CPP, CPP, CPP. has relatively high standards, uh, market style standards. Uh, and so it will take work for China to comply. And frankly, in the United States, uh, there are forces in the Democratic Party, not to mention the Republican Party, that don't 
like uh, uh, international economic regimes that they th think constrains the United States too much. So the point is, uh, I think that's the desirable way to go. But once again, particularly in this case, in the United States, neither political party, at least uh, for the last few years and now, seems very comfortable with the idea. Even though Japan took the lead after the U.S. pulled out of the TPP discussions. Yeah, I, I, I think now even UK now wants to join CPTPP. And China actually, uh, last year, uh, uh, Premier Li actually announced that at the National People's Congress and President Xi actually announced that at APEC summit. China right. is very interested to join that. And also Minister uh, Wang Wentov Movcom actually officially applied that just two months ago through right. New Zealand where the document is, is, is deposited. What, what I think now is that actually, if you talk about 10 years ago when, when CPTPP just started, it was, you know, may, maybe they think, you know, uh, China still follow up on the WTO and the TPP is high standard. It's maybe not, not, uh, not uh, uh, you know, compatible to what China has been doing. But now, you know, after the <laughs> eight, nine years later, China is actually catching up. You know, for example, you know, TPP is concerned about IPR. I mean, IPR China has the largest patent applicants uh, uh, in the world now. And, uh, and also TPP has a high environmental standard. And China, you know, President Xi's uh, uh, Green Mountain, Blue Water is the Gold Mountain, and Gold Water is already deeply <laughs> embedded into Chinese uh, 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 in a concept. And, uh, and also you have uh, these labor rights that has to be uh, respected. Now China calls for common prosperity, exactly trying to raise the labor of the migrant workers in the cities. And also digital right. economy. Digital economy, China is not one of the largest digital economy. Digital economy is already counts about 38 of China's GDP now. And of course, you mentioned about SOE, which is, I think, big worry uh, overseas. But, you know, why can't we really follow some competitive neutrality? You know, maybe in China, SOE is, is, is more needed, but when they perform outside, they could do a follow-up uh, uh, competitive neutrality, which is internationally recognized. So, so there could be ways to talk. If right, I, yeah. I agree yeah. with uh, yeah. most of what you've said. Uh, I think an American would respond, or at least many Americans would respond, that they're reluctant to make new agreements with China on the economics when we didn't get satisfaction on the phase one trade deal. So one thing I was hoping might come out of the Xi-Biden talk was some movement forward that would allow American politicians to say, we negotiated with China, we didn't get everything we wanted, but when we did agree, China lived up to it. Now, of course, the COVID virus came along. Uh, our bilateral relationship had many problems. So objectively speaking, you can understand why there have been problems. Yeah. But the average American realizes that there were agreements to purchase large amounts of U.S. exports, and basically that has not happened. Of course, Chinese would say, you, you Americans threw tariffs on us, and not only on us, but even American allies. Uh, mm -hmm. So in any case, I think we have to find a way to restore trust in previous agreements before there's too much appetite for new agreements. But I do, oh, and you said one thing I thought was very, uh, one of many things, very insightful. And that you, you said that actually um, European countries uh, have expressed some, I'm not sure how much, but some interest in the uh, PTPP or CPTPP. Uh, and uh, I would say the more uh, uh, Europeans that express interest, uh, and the more interest China really expresses in getting in that organization, you'll find the Americans will not want to be left out. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so I think in some sense, let's try to repair as best we can past agreements, or at least live up to them going forward, uh, and uh, restore credibility to the idea of negotiation. 
Uh, and then I think if uh, China and others uh, move towards uh, multilateralism, uh, the CPTPP, uh, you'll find the Americans will get more interested. That's my prediction. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Actually, the, I was at a uh, 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 you know, uh, symposium webinar with uh, uh, Virtual Web like yesterday with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Kobo Foundation of Germany. And actually, there were people suggesting EU should be in the CPTPP as well. Uh, uh, so, you know, this kind of multilateral arrangement uh, it does help the, the, the world prosperity, like, like China joined WTO. This year is about 20 years uh, anniversary of China joined WTO. China's import from the world has gone up 60 times, six times. Right. And the export uh, has gone up seven times. Right. So, but still, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively, uh, you know. Up right, but Europe, Europe's a complicated prey place. And yes. generally speaking, the Germans are pretty forward leaning on relations with China, particularly <laughs> yes. economic relations. Uh, yeah. And I would just say as a, a piece of friendly advice, I think China needs to um, once again, remember Chairman Mao had the three worlds theory. Yes. And essentially there was the Soviet world, there was the American world, and then there were the intermediate zones, the middle sized powers. And I always thought it was a great strength of Chinese foreign policy to consolidate or, or to focus its energies on the middle powers, on the intermediate zone, so to speak. Now, we didn't like the way China focused on those, but the idea of keeping the, uh, the middle powers uh, at least friendly to China, I think is an important idea. And frankly, it seems to me China's uh, relations with several very important middle powers is, is, could use some repair. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's a good suggestion. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, because I think with the, with the trade war, you know, tariff war launched by uh, uh, Trump administration, you know, that actually impacted uh, many things. But also now uh, Blinken and uh, Biden comes up, they are seeking uh, allies, allies of a kind of a AUKUS or Quad, you know, all coming up uh, uh, against China somehow. So, so I think you're right. I mean, we need to, you know, uh, uh, unite, you know, or maybe have friendly relations with many countries as possible. I mean, that certainly is the way I think China should should go. Uh, absolutely. Now, now I'd like to talk something uh, different. Uh, it's very interesting uh, that I noticed that actually last time you come to. CCG, I remember you were doing some exploratory, uh, investigative, uh, 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 you know, research and academic studies. Uh, we actually uh, had the two professors talk to you, <laughs> and now, now your book is coming out already. So you had the book of this uh, River of Iron, Railroads and the Chinese Power in the Southeast Asia. Uh, you co-author with uh, Selena Ho and Chen Jun Kuk. So, so maybe, you know, give us a bit of a, uh, uh, I, I, I know you are very, uh, you know, productive, had many books before, but this book particularly, the most recent book, uh, give it a bit of a, a, a highlight and, uh, and what it's about. Well, uh, I think the, the first thing to say is the book is about how China itself built a high-speed rail industry. And to make a very complicated story short, in about the year 2000, China didn't have a high-speed rail industry or a high-speed rail system. So the first part of the book describes how did China build uh, the technology and the infrastructure for a high-speed rail system, and it's quite a story. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, if I was a Chinese uh, trying to make the best case, I would say this is an example of how industrial policy and planning can work. Because you moved very rapidly to develop the technology and then lay down the infrastructure. I, I would think outside of a wartime circumstance, no major country besides China could do something so big so fast. Now, of course, when you do things big and fast, mistakes happen. So. 
that that happened in China. But basically, you developed very rapidly a, a what you might call technology forcing industry. In the United States, Boeing aircraft not only built airplanes, it developed metallurgy, instrumentation, navigation, all of the things that surround these systems. So in building your high-speed rail system, you built a driver for many other parts, high-tech parts of your economy. So part of the first part of the story is how you built this industry. Now, once you had it, you and particularly once you built your own system, you then had an industry that was an export industry, like Boeing is for the United States or Airbus for, for Europe. And so the second part of the story is how China tried to, and is trying, and as uh, we were discussing before the show, uh, soon uh, in, I believe this uh, next month, your rail line from Kunming to uh, Vientiane, uh, the capital of Laos, will open up. So the first part of this export system to Southeast Asia will open up soon. The second part of the book, therefore, is about how China is negotiating with seven uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries on the, on the continent, not to include Indonesia, uh, how you're negotiating to build a system that will connect possibly uh, the seven Southeast Asian countries on the continent to the south of China and hook into the domestic system of China. Now, in describing how you're doing this, I want to make, a, I think it's a very important point that we make in the book. This idea of an interconnected Southeast Asia was not, uh, with China, was not particularly a Chinese idea. This wasn't Hu Jintao's idea. This wasn't Jiang Zemin's idea. It wasn't Xi Jinping's idea. In this particular case, the Southeast Asians, going back to the colonial powers, the, the French, uh, the British in Southeast Asia, wanted to connect by rail to China to penetrate inland China. So, but what China did do is build the industry, then got the capital, and now it's helping Southeast Asia build out this plan. So this isn't a case of China forcing uh, infrastructure plan on reluctant Southeast Asians. In fact, the Southeast Asians came to Premier Zhu Rongji uh, in around 1995, as I recall, or maybe I think he was vice premier then, and asked whether China would help finance railroad development in Southeast Asia. And Zhu Rongji said, no, we don't have the money or the technology, not the time for us. Well, a few years later, China did have the money and the technology, and now has been pushing forward. So the bulk of the book deals with China in negotiation with the Southeast Asian countries to gradually, <coughs> ibu ibu, build this step, this system. And ultimately, it'll go from Kunming, I believe, probably within 20 or so years, <coughs> a little uncertain, but I believe there will be a system of connectivity of high-speed rails, and I think it'll probably eventually, uh, in the next 20 or so years, reach Singapore, uh, and if not Singapore, uh, certainly Kuala Lumpur. So uh, this book is that story. Now, I just, it's, I don't want to talk too long, just to say one other thing. I think this represents, some people ask, is this a strategy? Is this China's strategy to take over Southeast Asia? <clears throat> and I would say no. Uh, it's a strategy to make China central to what you might call the uh, East and Southeast Asian economic system. And you're building connectivity, <clears throat> just like we knitted together our continent with a transcontinental railroad here. And so I think this effort 
leave it aside. Each, each specific project may be better or worse, but overall the concept is strong that China is going to get rich if its neighbors get rich. And if our neighbors are going to get rich, they need to be connected to us, to China, and they need to be connected to each other. And so I think this is building the infrastructure for economic modernization and integration in Asia. And this isn't a plot by China to take over the world or that region. It's an it's a intelligent effort to create economic interactions that will be beneficial to everyone. Now, of course, there's going to be corruption and all of the things that go along with such a vast vision. But I think the United States, uh, about a year or two in 2018, began to wake up to the power of this vision. And so now you see the U.S. negotiating with the Australians and the Japanese, talking to the Koreans, uh, the Europeans, about how we might cooperate to help build up infrastructure uh, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere in the world. So I think, you know, a little competition in this area would be okay. But the basic pattern is that the United States is waking up to the need for infrastructure in much of the world, not to mention ourselves. <laughs> We've got our own infrastructure problem too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, for the highlight of this, uh, of this great book, actually. I remember, uh, you know, how seriously you've done the study. You, you, I, I still remember uh, you, you were here in uh, 2015, 16. We actually introduced a professor from uh, Beijing Jiaotong University who is a specialist on, on high-speed railway to talk right. to you. Uh, but, but you are very I, grateful for your help. Yeah. And I, I would just say, uh, in our, yeah. we were talking about U.S.-China relations. Yeah. We should not let the, the problems that our two governments have obstruct academic and intellectual exchange. Absolutely. And I'm afraid that, frankly, both our governments are making it more difficult. Yeah, yeah. One of the uh, positive outcome of this President Xi and Biden summit is that the, the same day they announced they have new, uh, resumed the journalist uh, visa and exchanges. So, so there is something <laughs> positive going on. Last right. time when I talked to in September, we had a release of Madame Mon. And this time, and the same day, we hear the news uh, uh, of, uh, of journalist visa has been relaxed. So I hope there will be more positive news on the trade and many other fronts. Right. But coming back to this uh, infrastructure project, I, you're absolutely right. You, you know, around year 2000, China really has not not much uh, railway, uh, on the speed railway. You know, myself, I myself, growing up in a, in a railway <laughs> a parent's family, you know, my, my father actually went to Africa to build the Tanzania-Zambia railway. So, uh, oh. so that was one first time uh, when how China trying to develop its international railway business. Right. But, uh, but you see, you know, that's incredible. Now China has two thirds of the, uh, of the speed, uh, of the length of the speed railway uh, uh, for, for the world now. Correct. And the total length of uh, China's speed railway is equal to the next 10 countries combined. Right. Whereas US, US military budget is equal to the next 10 countries combined. So, so I think, you know, you know, using this uh, infrastructure as a connectivity is really great. And, uh, and you're right, you know, now U.S. is uh, wake up to that. And President Biden, you know, during the same day, he's talking to President Xi. He signed his uh, 1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. Right. That, uh, that uh, you know, that talking to, 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 to during his, uh, you know, on the same day when he meet President Xi. So, so I think now even the G7 or G20 summit, uh, G7 summit, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, and G7 country proposed the uh, uh, B3W, a uh, Build Back Better World. Right. So how do, how do you think, you know, do we need, uh, uh, you know, we talk about a lot of differences, a lot of disputes and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, different in values and things like that. But, but exactly the case like you studied, you know, this connectivity, this infrastructure, you know, not only to help your neighbors, but also, you know, help yourself. And if the world is... Uh, <laughs> If the war is really in that kind of mentality, you know, let's help each other, let's build infrastructure for the next uh, half a century, that would be probably the biggest pie uh, for, right. for all countries to work on. And, uh, and uh, maybe we could even upgrade uh, AIB to GIB, to Global Infrastructure Investment Bank. And maybe US and Japan should join that. 
And uh, so what do you think about the prospect of uh, let's have an infrastructure, uh, a global alliance or global bank of somehow, well, and US China should work on that, and B3W and BI should be combined or, uh, in some fashion, maybe? Well, I think uh, this is my personal view. I think the US and others should say the world needs infrastructure. Uh, in many cases, we, uh, the United States, or we, the Germans, or French, Italians, Canadians, uh, have certain talents, and we should uh, work together to build infrastructure. Now, I think in the case of Southeast Asia, it's close to China. <clears throat> China's the biggest trading partner for almost all Southeast Asian countries now. So I think it's natural that China will have a leading role in that set of infrastructure. But if we were talking about the Americas and knitting together even more Canada, US and Mexico, I presume the United States would play a bigger role because it's closer to home. And of course, the Europeans will play a bigger role in the further integration of Europe. <clears throat> so I, my point is that I think uh, China, the United States, the Europeans have, well, you might say their backyards or their, their economic uh, natural communities. And therefore, you'll see more activity by China in Asia, more, more perhaps by the U.S. in our own country initially, and then in our region and the same in, in Europe. But uh, I think also you, this gets back to the point I made. China with its the big role of its SOEs, particularly in this industry. <laughs> I mean, frankly, Beijing can tell the railroad corporation what you want to happen and they can finance it. In the US, the government can't tell the companies what to do. So it has to be attractive to them. So in the US, for instance, maybe we provide um, investment insurance. Maybe we provide um, certain benefits to encourage companies. But in the end, this difference between a publicly oriented economy versus a more centralized economy, uh, I think it means that the US will probably not play as big a role as China in building mm -hmm. infrastructure all over the world. That would mm -hmm. just be my guess. But I think the U.S. should try, and I think we ought to work with our, our friends. And I, I'm, I, in that sense, I mean China, too, if the opportunity. But we certainly can work with the Koreans, uh, South Koreans. We can move work with the Canadians that are quite advanced in this area. Uh, the French, uh, Italians, they all have something to contribute. So my guess is the U.S. will be somewhat less involved in terms of the amount of money. Uh, it'll be more private oriented than a Chinese approach would be. But that on balance, we're going to do more of this in more places in the world. Because, frankly, the same way China benefits from this integration and connectivity, if the U.S. is going to achieve economies of scale, we need to benefit from closer connection to bigger markets. And so I think we're in going in the same connectivity direction. And I don't think globalization is dead. You're not going to have to take the word globalization out of your center's name. It's, <laughs> it's a reality. So, yeah, yeah, and, no, and I you. think the U.S. is getting into the game. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, 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 for praise. Uh, I mean, globalization, of course, is not that. And uh, we, I'm, I'm sure the standard will have globalization for, for, for a long time to come. Uh, what, what I say, actually, I, you know, I, I can see this uh, uh, infrastructure as the biggest common denominator for, for, for the whole world. I mean, for developed countries and, you know, for countries like Africa, Latin America, Central Asia. Uh, ASEAN and uh, you know everywhere. So but even in, in the United States and in Europe. So so actually you know according to the G20, uh, uh, there's a there's a center GIH. Actually they have actually issued a, a global infrastructure uh, prospect report. 
basically saying by 20, from 2016 to 2040, the global infrastructure investment needs will increase to 94 trillion US dollars. And every year will be 3.7 trillion US dollars. So, so it's so, so much in big demand actually. And, and also the World Bank actually has, a, has actually issued a, a, a one by one road economics basically a report and the saying that, uh, uh, you know, one by one road uh, construction will, will let the Belt and Road uh, 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 along the root countries increase their income from one, you know, to 1.2 to 3.4%. And global actual income will increase from 0.7 to 2.9%. So there will be common prosperity, not just for China, but, but for the whole world. So, uh, so what do you think about this, uh, this BRI? I mean, you know, China is doing railway in the, in the, uh, in the Southeast Asia country. It's kind of a maritime silk road, if you're using the Chinese term. They are trying to help uh, building this uh, connectivity. But, uh, but, but the BRI, you know, I mean, this is a, a scheme that uh, China has been launching for eight years now. Just two years ago, right. uh, Central China had a big meeting. Yeah. So, so what do you think of the prospect of a, a BRI and how we can really work together? I mean, uh, China doesn't want to work it by itself. It's, it's the, the principle of that is uh, jointly uh, consulted, jointly build and jointly benefit. So, right. so, so how, what's your take on, on, on well, SBI? Well, of, of, of course, I would defer to you in particular and Chinese people in general, but it's my uh, impression that BRI itself has, is evolving over time. That as China gets involved in more places around the world, more different kinds of infrastructure, uh, some places China's operating are not very politically stable. Others are much more secure. Uh, China's learning lessons and also how to deal with different political systems because it's very uh, sensitive to build infrastructure in another political system because they're organized differently and you face indigenous groups of various sorts that might not like what's happening. So I think China's learning and on balance, I think China's becoming a little more cautious. And as China's growth slows, which I think generally speaking over time it will, uh, China will and, and other needs for China domestically are big. So I, I, looking at the discussion in China, I think Chinese are themselves asking how much of our national talent and resource and technology should we devote to outside of China versus inside of China? And even inside of China, how much to domestic needs versus military needs? So what I try to tell um, <coughs> Western observers at least as my understanding, is China debates about all these issues. And you're feeling your way towards sounder policy and not becoming overly committed financially. And it's always been my understanding that one reason China wanted the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank was to have others besides China finance a lot of this infrastructure. And frankly, I thought that was a pretty good idea. And I think uh, the United States made, uh, I will say strategic error under the Obama, Obama administration not to join this. <laughs> and in fact, when China drew up the charter for the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, it was an American lawyer that helped the Chinese do it, right? Yes. So uh, all I would say is, uh, yes, I think China will become more involved over time, but it will be, I think, increasingly careful. It will want to spread the risk to other countries beyond itself. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that we'll see China more constrained by competing demands for budget. So, yes, it's going to go on. Yes, I think it will be, is and will continue to be very important. But 
it's still only going to be a small part of what the world needs. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I, I'm, I, you know, we are thinking, you know, if uh, if this B Street W and BI can somehow work together, find a mechanism. I mean, B Street W, as you said, China maybe already have investment, have some technology, infrastructure capacity, and then you know, B Street W may be more on the on the legal and the, and the, and the other aspect, uh, uh, local condition may be more familiar because because the U.S. and and Western multinationals are really interested in, in BI and uh, wants to work together. And also that, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, AIB, as you've said, you know, it's uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Can we really set up a, a Belt and Road International Bank Alliance, like we should be led by, you know, World Bank, AIB, ADB, FDB, you know, Latin American Development Banks. Let's all the development banks work together for the infrastructure revolution and transformation for the next half a century, uh, so that we have a big well, height to work on, and we don't have this, to do a lot of geopolitical uh, competition. Th th these are the things I'd like to be talking about, but instead <laughs> yes. we're talking about red lines, and we're talking about bad faith agreements, and so forth. So we've got to get I'd our like to dialogue to the about. point where we can. But start, instead, start we're talking about, about red lines that are and, very important. But I, I should, in all realism, say. I think the security frictions of our between our two countries, right at the moment, but, are growing. And as long as our um, security relationship is a sort of a more threat oriented rather than opportunity oriented, you're then going to find people in I think probably in China, but certainly in the U.S. Say, how can we help China increase its connectivity to the rest of the world if we face a, um, a sort of a security a threat. threat. So I think the precondition to moving ahead on these good economic ideas is to get our security relationship under control. And <clears throat> frankly, it's not under control. I mean, it's not out of control yet, but it's certainly not under control. Yeah, yeah, right. I think that that uh, you know the trust and uh, and uh, and mutual understanding you know we build up is very important. So this high level uh, head of the state diplomacy, I mean, hopefully can stabilize the relation and even you know uh, put the guardrails against those uh, potential risk. Uh, that then we start those constructive dialogues. I mean, really, I hope that. Uh, 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 you know, people in the commerce, in the in the in the treasury, in the economic, and probably the banks. I mean, AIB is already a good uh, internationally acceptable uh, model. One hundred four countries are member. Uh, all the Western member are in it, ex except the uh, U.S. And, and Japan. So maybe we could, uh, uh, you know, work on that. So 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 what I what I think that uh, uh, you know uh, your book. I mean, on this. Uh, 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 infrastructure in the eye, you know, this eye uh, rail uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Southeast Asia is really a case in point uh, that such a strong demand and needs for this infrastructure connectivity. So, so I really think that uh, development banks and the US aid and China International Development uh, Cooperation Agency and, 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 and CEDA and many other international agencies should work together. Uh, also with the development banks. And let's, you know, through the UN, maybe somehow we find a way to connect the world with, uh, with a massive uh, infrastructure uh, gradual uh, build up so that we can avoid, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, hot, uh, uh, you know, war actually. I mean, because if we ca kept the geopolitical tension, we may end up, you know, uh, destroy the war. So, so, so I think you're right. I mean, the, the, the efforts, your research in this aspect really bring the, the understanding of what China is doing in Southeast Asia and to that matter to the world, how we can really work together. Well, I think in that uh, regard, you know, there are small steps we can take. And I think the first small step, it's actually going to be a pretty big step, is getting our people going back and forth, talking to each other again, uh, in person, on a sustained basis. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think one of our top priorities in U.S.-China relations ought to be how can we sooner rather than later restore our, um, 
our um, uh, person to person contact. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's very, very important. And uh, uh, we really need to, uh, resto res you know, re uh, you know, restore the restore the uh, the uh, people to people uh, exchanges. I I I think really uh, it's great that U.S. has uh, had admitted over hundred thousand Chinese students going back to the United States yeah. during this uh, pandemic summer, and uh, and I hope that uh, we will have U.S. student come to China as well. And and uh, to that matter, you know, next year hopefully you, we can contain the situation and we can really. Uh, you know, uh, start some kind of a new, finding the optimal uh, uh, point where we can maintain the minimum cases, but maximizing the people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. And we hope you can come back and you're right. We have to see each other rather than just talking virtually. And that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Well, when I get the chance to come back to China, I hope we can talk in person. Absolutely. So, so we, 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 we almost come to the, to the uh, end of, of our, our dialogue. I mean, I really appreciate your, your stay up late. And, uh, but, but actually, we, we, my, my staff uh, talked to me that there was over, almost a quarter million people watching us <laughs> online. So, uh, uh, so oh. that's good to know. And, uh, but, but we also have some media question that has, uh, you know, uh, that uh, they know that I'm dialoguing with you and then they actually posed uh, to me uh, beforehand, so there's uh, there's there's one question from uh, China Daily. Uh, so so what's your take on the BRI's uh, 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 contribution to the world and and how we can uh, you know really uh, work to that uh, direction? So that's one uh, one question. And another question from Guan Cha, a, a, a media based in Shanghai. So uh, among the Trans Asian Railway Network outside China. The China Lost Railway is to be very first to open. What do you think? You know, uh, this this will bring uh, demonstrating effect. So you probably covered some of that already. And then another question is that uh, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the establishment of China ASEAN dialogue relation. Actually, yesterday, President Xi and an ASEAN leaders just had a summit on that. And ASEP will come into effect on January 1st next year. Uh, so it will be cover one third of global economy and 90% and of the goods. Uh, we, we achieved a zero tariff for, for that agreement. Uh, so on the other hand, the trade war is still going on and uh, with US and China and the tariff. So what do you think of the possibility of, uh, of you know, the tariff coming down between China and the US? And uh, so, so, so this is uh, this is uh, you know basically uh, what what we have uh, uh, for question. Actually, they also mentioned about China and ASEAN formally announced the establishment of a comprehensive strategic partnership between China and ASEAN. So, uh, but also, U.S. is trying to do this Indo-Pacific, and 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 so so. What do you think of this uh, economic ties that? Uh, that is really a, a, a great direction to work for, rather than uh, we are trying to form AUKUS or, or, or those quad uh, uh, security type of alliance. So, so it's a, it's a host of questions. Maybe you can yeah, give some quite, answers. Quite a few questions there, but let me just try to briefly address uh, maybe three of them. One is that, as we, we mentioned, uh, the Laos uh, Vientiane to Kunming line should open up uh, in December. And I think the question was, well, what kinds of effects will this have uh, in Laos? And I would say in the region more broadly. Uh, first of all, the Laos link is really the first on the continent of Southeast Asia link that will have been completed. And of course, all the surrounding states, whether we're looking at Malaysia, or particularly Thailand, which is next to um, uh, Laos, uh, Vietnam, all the countries around Laos are looking at how the project goes with Laos. And once it's completed, then I think that creates more incentives for others in Southeast Asia to join. So I would say 
The success of the Laos situation is very important, and all of the states will be looking at that results of that project, asking themselves now, does this make it more, uh, does it make it preferable for us to join the system later or sooner or later? So I think the Laos, the completion is very important, not just to Laos, but the calculations of all the countries around it, particularly Thailand, because now Thailand knows there's going to be a, a connection to China through Laos. And Thailand, they want to run the railroad from the Thai border with Laos at Nong Khai uh, down to Bangkok. So the next big question is be, what will the Thais do? Uh, also, of course, the Vietnamese and the Burmese on the left and the right, so to speak, or the east and the west, are looking to see whether Thailand. they want to uh, join this system. So I would say the Laos uh, is, a, is a big, let us say, advertisement for the system. <clears throat> also, with respect to Laos, I think it's very um, Im important uh, on, on a theoretical level, you might ask, where did the title for my bo our book come from, Rivers of Iron? Well, actually, that was a phrase that was used in an interview by a Laotian planner who said, you know, the great countries of Europe and indeed China and many other countries <coughs> developed their cities and their commerce by rivers. Now it's true Laos sits next to the Mekong, but much of the Mekong not very navigable. So he said, we don't really have access to the sea. We're, we have no, we're the only Southeast Asian country, no access to the sea. So he said, we need to build our iron rivers. We need to make up through infrastructure what nature did not provide us in terms of rivers and easy transportation. So I think the, the completion of the Laos, uh, it's, it's very important. It's much bigger a fact than the about 7 million people who live in Laos. Frankly, economically, Laos uh, and the train will probably, I would guess, lose money. But in terms of its effects on the decisions of others and uh, facilitating the development of this network over time, I think it's very important. Now, one of your uh, questioners asked about RCEP, uh, and um, all I would say is uh, I'm not an expert on free trade areas, but I would note that the United States is really not, um, uh, the member uh, isn't pursuing free trade agreements very actively with anybody in Asia. And I think, uh, I've always thought that free trade, or at least freer trade, uh, is on balance if there are fair rules. Uh, through comparative advantage, everybody's better off. So I'm very, uh, I would say, almost alarmed that the United States is allowing everybody else to build the free trade structure. Uh, and yet, um, you know, we seem to not be pursuing free trade agreements very um, rigorously. Uh, you asked what were the prospects for the tariffs? And I can't speak for the U.S. government. I have no special information, but I would certainly note they didn't seem to be very prominent in the discussion between our two presidents. Certainly publicly, nothing encouraging that I've heard has been said about tariffs. And frankly, going into elections in the United States and the importance of congressional support, uh, I think right now there is very little support for uh, tariff reduction here. Certainly some industries and economists would like tariff reductions, but I don't think that's the over, uh, let us say, the prevailing sentiment in, uh, in certainly the Democrat, Democratic Party. So, you know, I think we ought to move ahead on improving our own economic policy. Um, I think we ought to uh, negotiate with China to uh, the phase one trade deal and reducing tariffs. Uh, but once again, the domestic environment's not very um, conducive to that at the moment. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Davey. And uh, uh, we, we, we almost come to the end. And uh, it's really a fascinating discussion. I think your book is really uh, served as a very good uh, case study 
of, of, uh, of this uh, connectivity of, of this uh, maritime Silk Road that actually by having allows to, uh, to, to start uh, this uh, first uh, uh, railway connecting uh, uh, China and Laos. And to that matter, as you said, as a demonstrating case to the ASE other ASEAN countries, it will, it will really change the, uh, the future infrastructure landscape of ASEAN and the uh, connectivity in Southeast Asia. So, so this is the right thing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm really admiring you that uh, uh, through your deep uh, uh, discussion and the research have come up with such a, a great book on, on this uh, great, a great subject. Uh, also, I would like to also re recommend you uh, another book that we just recently uh, edited. I edited it with, uh, uh, as Michi. It's called Consensus or Conflict, China and the Globalization in the 21st Century, which, which we talk about many issues we, we actually uh, touched upon. And this book, we had, uh, uh, you know, authors contribute like great uh, subject. Joseph and I, uh, also and Pascal Ami and uh, uh, Lord Jim O'Neill, Wendy Cutler, uh, um, you know, also other, other Edmund, F Edmund F Phillips, you know, Nobel laureates and many others. So I, I'll send you a book on that uh, yep. so, so we can keep the dialogue. And uh, so once again, and I think this, this is a fascinating the... discussion. We covered uh, uh, quite a number of issues, talk about China and U.S. bilateral relation, uh, the recent uh, President Xi and President Biden summit. Particularly, we talk about uh, uh, your new book about this uh, uh, connectivity, uh, the first project, uh, you know, River of the Eye, <laughs> I mean, in, in, in Laos, and actually that is uh, extended to ASEAN countries. And also to that matter, how we can uh, BI and, uh, and B3W and China and AIB, World Bank, everybody, how we can work together. And that is the dialogue uh, discussion that we need rather than we are talking all those uh, uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, military uh, uh, line. So, so, so thank you so much and uh, appreciate your time and late in the evenings. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, when you come to China. Well, so, thank you and happy holidays. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, David. We'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. Good bye bye. Also, thank to our, to our audience. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.